Oh, we made it. Oh, I don't feel like... Two thousand years ago, Harad built a fortress and called it Herodium after himself. It is located in West Bank, at the edge of Judean Desert. I have come back to Herodium, to this theater, again in the service of the king. But this time I was called not to build, but to demolish. King Herod, I did such amazing projects for him. And this theater was my work as well. But it's due now. The king has decided to alter Herodian altogether and transform the whole mountain into his mausoleum. Can you hear them? Those are the workers about to begin the demolition. Oh, what a pity. So few people had time to admire the artwork that decorates these walls. I remember well the exact moment when Herod gave the order to create them. He returned from one of his journeys with news. In just a few months, Marcus Agrippa, the emperor's second in command, will come on a royal visit, and he will be hosted here too in Herodium. The palace was in a state of frenzied anticipation. The king gave orders to prepare for the visit by meeting the standards that Agrippa was accustomed to in Rome. The finest wine, preserved apples from Italy, fish sauce from Spain. But the most important task of all was the redecoration of the theater's royal hall. The king has his own reasons. He knows that even artwork can sometimes have political significance. The first thing the artists had to do was replaster the walls. After that, they sculpted the upper part of the room in stucco relief, a special kind of plaster. What a marvelous decoration it is. It gives the flat wall depth, like stone carvings. The artists divided the space of the walls with plaster columns, decorated with leaves and crowned by capitals. Between the columns, high up the walls, they designed windows with wooden blinds open to the view. Look carefully. They are not real windows, but paintings of windows hung on the walls. In all his building projects, Herod avoided images of animals or people in obedience to the biblical prohibition. But here, in this room, 
Herod made an exception to that custom. He gave orders to paint views of Egypt and the Nile, selected especially for the guest. After all, the conquest of Egypt by the Emperor's army under Agrippa's command symbolizes the unity of the Empire. Look, goats on a rocky cliff with a cypress tree and shrine. And here a crocodile slides into the Nile. And this picture, a bull under a big tree in a pasture. And in the background, a boat at sea. And the colors are so vibrant and natural. Paintings like this were rare, even in Rome. <laughs> For my workers, finishing the work before the visit seemed an impossible task. Uh, but Herod never accepted impossible as an option. Behold, the big moment has arrived. Marcus Agrippa, the emperor's second in command, has entered the harbor of Caesarea. The city was festively decorated, the crowds came out to greet the illustrious guest, and here began the journey that Herod had planned for Agrippa, into the heart of Judea, to the edge of the desert, to Herodium. As the visit progressed, Agrippa was more and more amazed he did not expect to find such splendor and grandeur at the remote edge of the empire. He smiled with pleasure when he identified the wine from a famous Italian vineyard as his own favorite back home. But Herod had one more surprise for Agrippa, the high point of all his gestures of esteem. Herod led him to the second floor of the royal guest hall. Agrippa was deeply moved as he stood in front of a painting of a naval battle. He recognized it at once, the Battle of Actium, his greatest triumph, where he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, handing Egypt to the Emperor Augustus on a silver platter. The depiction was so vivid that Agrippa's memories came flooding back, and for a brief moment, he felt the painting was come to life. Oh, King Herod, he knew how to please those he needed to, but also to arouse fear. This cruel man was enormously talented, a lion and a fox in one. His reign was remarkable. The kingdom flourished, trade prospered, people lived well. Despite the venomous criticism aimed at him, I always thought we should not forget the greatness of the man who changed Judea more than all his predecessors. But years go by, and the king feels his end is near, and the show will not go on forever. So he has brought us here, again, to this very room, but this time to demolish it to cover it with earth, and turn the entire mountain into the eternal mausoleum of Herod, king of Judea. The royal hall has now become the sleeping quarters of the demolition crew. In the last days of the theater, everyone tries to leave his mark on these walls. One etches a maze or a rosette, another draws a boat with a piece of charcoal. I, too, feel that my end is near. This will apparently be my last assignment. But before I leave this world, I would like to learn one thing. Is it true that everything is destined to disappear with time? In 2,000 years from now, will anyone still know who Herod, king of Judea, was? <laughs> who knows? Perhaps somewhere. Far into the unforeseeable future, this theater will again be full of people and the sounds of talk and music. <laughs> Who knows? How the fortress used to look like? But it looks like this now. It's demolished. The top part you can see. Thank you, baby.
I don't know. He he was selling me like the idea of the treasure on the car. He was like, oh, I'm gonna of King Herod's enterprises, and is the place where he chose to be buried and to commemorate his name. His tomb was robbed and taken apart in the first century C, swallowed by the mountain, and remaining a mystery until it was discovered in 2007 by Professor Ehud Nitzel. Trekking Herod's tomb was a life journey of Professor Ehud Nitzar. Since 1970, he was looking for the lost legendary tomb. The Israel Museum also made a special exhibition of it, but unfortunately, Professor Netzer himself did not see that. While preparing for it, Netzer accidentally fell not too far away from tomb and passed away two days later. 